if my people would humble themselves and pray, they would that he would heal the land and he would give us a divine extension right now, real time. And I want to open up today with Revelation 18, uh, the first four, four verses here, five verses. Let me read it to you as written. May you have eyes to see, ears to hear. And I'm going to start in Revelation 18. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lighted with his glory. In other words, the glory of God was in the presence of everybody that received him. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen. Babylon is a, are the nations that just are godless. They don't believe in God's word and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and cage of every unclean and hateful bird. You can see that in uh, cross-referencing it today, brothers and sisters, Jeremiah 50, verse 39, Isaiah 21, verse 9, giving us the info on the unclean spirits, or as we know them today, demons. And honestly, brothers and sisters, you know, Christians have in the flesh the unclean spirits. And that's because of the rudiments of the world, the appetites of the flesh. And there's so much I want to talk about today with prayer and fasting. And for such a time as this, as we're, leave, we're living in the uh, latter times, for all, verse 3, Revelation 18, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of the, her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich with the abundance of her delicacies. And that's the people that are godless. And it's, a, it's about the rudiments of the world. It's about living your best life now. It has nothing to do with the spiritual walk or why Christ died on a cross for us. He died to give us eternal life. And I pray that you receive that today, listening to the downfall of Babylon. And as we've been studying Isaiah lately, nothing but the Moanites, the Amorites, and all the other ungodly people surrounding Israel, which were God's chosen people. And, and, and Revelation 18 today in verse 4 is, where God started me early this morning, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that you may be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive none of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God had remembered her iniquities. Uh, Jeremiah 51.9 reward her even as she rewarded you and double into her double according to her works in the cup which she had filled had filled fill to her double how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously so much torment and sorrow give her for she said in her heart i sit as a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow what pride is that, brothers and sisters? Therefore shall her plague come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judged, judged her. And that's what happens to the nations that are uh, living unclean before God. And it's the blood of Jesus Christ that washes, blots out the handwriting on a wall. And, and the sins, and, and you know, one of the things I, I want to talk about is a child, and we're children of the, the king, and why passivity is not a good place to be. You know, when Jesus was here, let me give you some scriptures to start today. 
uh, scripture teach us to resist the devil in steadfast faith, withstand him, be firm in faith against the onslaught, onslaught rooted, established, strong and immovable and determined. We are furthermore charged to be aggressive in the employment of our spiritual weapons because the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood, but they are mighty before God for the overthrow and destruction of the stronghold, 2 Corinthians 10, 4. Uh, the words of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ addresses all believers that are especially, they're, they're, it's powerful because in the Bible, in Mark 16, 17, and these attesting signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out evil spirits, demons. Every aspect of our spiritual walk is to be characterized by an aggressive action, brothers and sisters. If anyone were justified in resting on the laurels, it was the Apostle Paul, however, he did not, he wasn't complacent over any of his past achievements or his past failures. He said, I press on in, in uh, Philippians 3, 12 to 13 and 14. He says, I press on to lay hold of and make known that for which Christ Jesus, the Messiah, had laid hold of me and made me his own. I did not consider, brethren, that I have captured or made it my own yet. But one thing I did do, it is, it is my inspiration for getting what lies behind and straining toward which lies ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the supreme and heavenly prize to which God in Christ Jesus is calling us to himself. And 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 unfortunately in the book War on the Saints, why are why are uh why can't can passivity be reversed? Why is it so important for us to be aggressive but to be anxious and nothing but by prayer and supplication love is an essential to a stable personality passivity is found in individuals who have not been loved adequately a child must be conceived in love birth in love and brought up in the love environment otherwise such an individual is destined to become like a schizophrenic a divided personality which a double-minded man is unstable in all their ways when a person has a passive personality, they're withdrawn, filled with self-pity, imprisoned with self, you know, and I wanted to talk about that today in discipline, because self, self is a big spirit that Christians uh, are brought into, you know, self-pity, or, or it's all about that person. A disciplined life is not passive. So discipline in the formative days of one's life is essential in strengthening our personality. The children become and require more discipline than others, so discipline must be done in keeping with the person's needs. A child cannot learn self-discipline on his own. He must be disciplined that he will become disciplined. And that's why we need the Word of God. The Word of God disciplines all of us, brother. You know, in Hebrews... Chapter 12, verse 6, when, when God's talking to us in the book of Hebrews, uh, without proper discipline, kids become unruly and his behavior will embarrass his parents. Well, likewise with our Heavenly Father when he disciplines us. For the Lord corrects and disciplines everyone whom he loves and punishes. He even scourges every son whom he accepts and welcomes to his heart, and God cherishes us for the time being. No discipline brings joy, but some grievous and painfulness happens. But in, a, in, in reality, it yields peaceable fruit, righteousness to those who have been trained in it. And, you know, that's in uh, Hebrews 12, 6, Hebrews 12, 11, Proverbs Withhold not discipline from the child, for if you strike and punish him, 
with a need like rod, he won't die. You shall whip him with the rod and deliver him from his uh, shell. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child undisciplined brings his mother to shame. That's in Proverbs 29, 15. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far from him. Proverbs 22, uh, 15. And, you know, self-discipline includes mind, emotions, volition, physical body, stewardship of your money, material possessions, and one's relationship, most importantly, brothers and sisters, with God. You know, and it's very important. Jesus said in Luke 14, verses 27 and 33 today, you know, God was putting this on my heart when I was studying this morning before I came in. And then, wouldn't you know it, the little he cup, something happened with the recording during the church fellowship today. And it was such a, a wonderful message. And then sometimes I do a better job second time through because it's our Sunday word. It's very important. You know, whoever does not persevere and carry his own cross, come. Jesus said, follow me. He says, if you can't do that, you can't be my disciple. So then anyone who does not forsake, renounce, surrender, claim, give up, or say goodbye to all that he has cannot be my disciple. And you could see that in Luke 14, verses 27. You can look at verse 33. And those who belong to Christ, the Messiah, have crucified the flesh, the godless human nature, with its passions, appetites, and desires. And that's in Galatians 5.24. Again, moving on to another book, Scripture out of 1 Thessalonians, that each one of you should know how to possess, control, manage his own body. I always go to Romans 12, 1 and 2, presenting our body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is our reasonable service. And no wonder why Satan's goal is to lure all of us into bondage to self. Every demon is self-orientated. It's a spirit that wants to act out its emotions and wills through our bodies. For example, pride is self-exaltation. Lust is self-indulgence. Rebellion is self-rule. Resentment is your own vindication. And inferiority is self-pity. Every demon name can be given a synonymous name because self is the prefix. There can be two opposite and possibly other bondages to self. First, exalting yourself above others. You know, secondly, thinking you're inferior to others through failure. Recognize your uniqueness today, brothers and sisters, as a... a as as a member of the body of Christ, and the gates of hell will not prevail against the body of Christ. Now, we all know that in churches, half the people today are not even believers. Some people go to church because they, they need socialization. They're hurting for friends. And in reality, brothers and sisters, walking in the Spirit is about Jesus Christ becoming or I always quote it as falling in love with the word of God, Jesus Christ. We must not be passive when it comes to the crucifixion of self. Paul explained it in Galatians 2.20. He said, I've been crucified with Christ. In him, I shared the crucifixion. It is no longer I who live, but Christ, our Messiah, that lives through me and in me by the power of the Holy Spirit. He even sealed us with that spirit when he saved us. So in our lives, to have a purpose for God is far greater than our personal ambitions and pursuits. If one is going to conquer passivity, he must learn to bear responsibility. And then you got to be led by the spirit, for every man shall bear his own burden, Galatians 6, 5, King James Version. So our lives have a purpose in Christ, in God, that is far greater than our personal ambitions and pursuits, so that 
one who hopes in Christ, who first has confidence in him, has been destined and appointed to live for the praise of God's glory. See, in us, he has his being. Only by recognizing and discern, discovering God's eternal plan for all of us and God's purpose for us being his ambassadors, God making his appeal as though it's through us as a royal priesthood, a holy nation, one who's surrendered and became an ambassador or a servant of the Most High God. You know, in the book of Psalms, King David expressed his goal for life. One thing I've asked of the Lord that I will seek, inquire for, and inconsistently require that I may dwell in the house of the Lord in his presence all the days of my life. Boy, that should be our little uh, mantra, daily living to, to be in God's presence every day. When I wake up in the morning, give me Jesus. To behold and gaze about the beauty, the sweet attractiveness, and the delightful lovingness of the Lord. To meditate and consider and inquire because we present our bodies as the temple of the Holy Spirit. You know, we sing that song all the time. Lord, create in me to be a sanctuary for your Holy Spirit. And, and, and the apostles set goals, you know. The power overflowing from God's resurrection in believers that it may share his suffering as to be continually transformed in the spirit into his likeness through his death. Paul voiced a goal for his own ministry in the book of Corinth. He said, for I resolve to know nothing, to be acquainted with nothing, to make a display of the knowledge of nothing and be conscious and nothing among you except Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And he preached it. That's the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall have everlasting life. That echoes in my heart every time I preach to people. And, and you know, so teach us and give us a heart of wisdom today and becoming a doer of your word, but he, but be doers of the word, obey the message and not merely listen to it, betraying yourself into deception by reasoning contrary to the truth of God's word. For if anyone listens of God's word today, brothers and sisters, if he thoughtfully observes himself, then goes on and promptly forgets what he once was like. Jesus Christ washed away our sins, and he doesn't remember them anymore because he washed them white as snow. We got to get into the spirit and walk in the spirit. Either we are doers of the word or we're sitting here with our hands being passive about what God wants out of us. And I mean, even to the fact that we're to edify and build up and we're not, we're supposed to have death and life or in the power of the tongue. So we're supposed to be edifying and building each other or not, not tearing each other down. One of the greatest things about the grace of God is passivity is unworthiness. There are still too many reciprocants of God's grace who feel they must do something to, re, re, to receive the merit of God's favor. But grace is commonly defined as unmerited faith. It is all that God did for us and through Christ that we are unable to do for ourselves. See, we all needed a Savior. So let's Let's understand Ephesians 2 8 a little here today. None of us are worthy within ourselves. That is what the cross is all about. You know, it really is all about the cross, our salvation. He, na he nailed the handwriting and blotted out the handwriting on the wall that was against us. I always point to it in back of me in the sanctuary to show people, for it is by grace 
God's unmerited favor that you and I are saved, delivered from the future judgment and made partakers of Christ's salvation by faith. And this salvation is not of yourselves or of your own doing. It came through your own or through your own striving because it came from God as a gift from God. And we all know the scripture, Ephesians 2.8. And instead of saying, I can't and I won't, there are some challenges to say, I can. Can you ever say, I can't, when God's word clearly says to all of us, I preach it all the time to everybody. I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I am ready for anything and equal to do anything through him who infuses inner strength. When we are weak, he makes us strong. I mean, there's just so many good scriptures for us not to lean on our own understanding because we will never get to that place of spiritual maturity until we begin to grow. And Paul expressed this, you know, in Philippians 3, 8, Christ Jesus, my Lord, and of progressively becoming more deeply and intimately acquainted with him. Or you could say we were perceiving, recognizing, and understanding him more and more fully as our spiritual development is progressive as long as we live in these temporal bodies, you know. Do you not know that in a race all the runners complete, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may hold on to the prize and make it yours. Now, every athlete who goes into a training conducts themselves temporarily and restricts themselves to all things. Therefore, I did not run uncertainly. I do not box like one beating the air and striking with the adversary all the time, but I buffet my body. I presented a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. I handle it roughly, discipline it by hardships and subdue it. If we ever became complacent over the level of maturity we've attained, then we, we then begin to be passive and we quit running the race. And, and you know, I always quote, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. 1 Corinthians 13, 13 speaks of faith, hope, and love. There are three cardinal virtues of our Christian life, brothers and sisters. They must be guarded and maintained in all times. Whensoever we see ourselves begin to slip, if any one of these virtues, it could be a warning sign to find out what's happened and correct it. Our faith is a spiritual foundation. It's on the basis of our relationship with God, the God of hope, who is the anchor of our soul, Hebrews 6, 19. Without hope and a joyful confidence, expectation of our future in Christ, we can fail and become a shipwreck. Love is the carnal virtue. Jesus summarized the Ten Commandments into two commandments in the New Testament. He says to love God with all your heart, all your soul, and then love your neighbor. In Matthew 22, 37, 38, 39, as written, and he replied to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, your intellect, brothers and sisters. This is the great, most important principle, and it's the first commandment. And second, it is like you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Some have made deliverance their ultimate goal in life. Deliverance is not the final goal. It's only a sub-goal on the way to fulfill God's purpose in our lives. Deliverance is no more the goal for us than the children of Israel escaping from the bondage of Egypt. God said to Pharaoh, let my people go so that they may serve me. Exodus 7, 16. There was a purpose for Israel beyond their escape from bondage. And there's a purpose in God for each and every one of us that's hearing my message today. 
God has called us to war, and we must be vigilant, for we're not ignorant of the devices of the enemy that's contrary to being a doer of God's word. If we lack a definite plan of aggression, we become passive to some degree. Also go back in time in the Old Testament when that shepherd boy, David, who was a man after God's own heart, decided to go to war. Although he won many battles and defeated thousands of enemy, there was a time when even David became passive. In the spring, when kings go forth to battle, David remained in Jerusalem, 2 Samuel 11.1. 1. It was in this time of passivity that temptation overtook him. David saw Bathsheba bathing, and he lusted after her and committed adultery with her, having her husband murdered in an attempt to cover up his sin. Psalm 51 tells us, of his pain from a defiled conscience and the repentance that restored his relationship with God. So we've shown you today, and I'm speaking it, you know, the second time's always better. Those that heard the first message, this is the second message, because I had to re-record my heart and my thoughts. And passivity will block your deliverance. The ways in which passivity works have been observed over myself being in deliverance for like uh, 38 and a half years, almost 39, brothers and sisters. And the list by any means is complete, but will give the reader of everything, or as should I, I say from the books, the hearer. See, faith comes by hearing God's word. And to look on other roads that in that book, War on the Saints, lead to passivity. One of the biggest challenges confronting everyone, especially people that are in deliverance, deliverance ministers today, it's essential for a person, person's will be given over to the work of God. Therefore, we always have to make a confession of faith and stand against Satan's kingdom. Because we do, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but powers, principalities, enemies. And we have to activate God's will in all of us. And the Bible says to confess our faults to one another and, and just praying. And we urge, if you got passivity, you can do self-deliverance every day on yourself. Spirits are breath, pneuma. Breath, or or you could say, I don't get behind me, Satan. I don't want you. Your spirit is a breath. Expelling the breath is an appropriate way, an effective way of dealing with the extreme passiveness that's going on within all of us. And you can play an active part in taking thoughts captive and rebuking the devil, resisting the devil, and he has to flee because it's written. It's the same thing. It's been found helpful to put pressure on an appropriate part of the body, top of the head, shoulders, abdomen, back, arms, hands. It should go without saying that in the touching of a person be done with utmost discretion. So please pray, you know. You have to pray. You have to pray confession. You have to have discerning of spirits. You have to know your obstacles, even in deliverance, and knowing the things that God talks about. You know, I started out with uh, revelation. Now I want to go into self. Self's a big one, people, you know. I, I can't say it enough to everybody that I talk to because in the in the Bible, in Exodus, the Lord gives us Exodus 15, 26. And this is this is powerful. I the Lord am your healer. 15 26. Exodus. 
if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? Well, your sins separate you, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, from prayers being answered. This quotation I just gave you is out of Matthew 7, 11. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, 25, Jesus Christ, he he himself, Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the cross, that he might die to sin and live in righteousness, and he imputed it. And for by his wounds, by his stripes, you are healed. We can see in many others that God reveals himself as a loving father who has made healing accessible to all of us by the shed blood of Jesus. It's not anyone's intention, but God's word, God's willingness to heal us. You may refer back to the word of God. There's many, many brothers over the years from uh, Derek Prince, I want to say Basham, Worley, Hobson, uh, Ken Olson, uh, Bill Banks, which could possibly uh, show us that God uses anyone that believes. And, you know, the first step of getting our wits together in the spirit is by an awakening to know that Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior. That's the first step. You got to ask him to save you. You got to ask him to teach you. The Bible says, through the quickening power of the Holy Spirit, therefore, if any man in Christ be a new creature, all things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You know, and I'm being repetitious today because I quoted a lot of these scriptures today, and, and your spirit is sealed by the Holy Ghost, Ephesians 1, 13, 2 Corinthians 4, 7, 12. I read it from the pulpit. I'm, I'm repeating what I presented from my notes today to everybody. The word of God says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of our God, not of us, so that no man can boast. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken, because Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Cast down, but not destroyed, because nothing can separate us from the love of God. Always hearing about the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, that life also in him dying and resurrected, Jesus might be made manifest in our bodies by the power of the Holy Spirit that seals us, dwells within us, even does some of the same miracles that Jesus did. For we which live are always delivered because of Jesus Christ. For his sake, he's delivered us from death. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh, so that death worketh in us, but life in you. In other words, so then death worketh in us, but life now is in us because of our faith in Christ. Paul is saying that even though we have the Holy God, the Holy Spirit living in our earthen vessels, you know, we have to die in order for the resurrection life of Jesus to flow through us, just as Jesus himself had to die in order that the Father would resurrect him. A kernel of wheat must die in the ground before it can bring forth fruit. That's in the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 24. And without death, there is no resurrection. And it's it's Christ, it's the Father that's going to raise us up upon redemption. To be absent from the body is present in the Lord. Because without death, there is no resurrection. Gal Galatians 2.20, King James Version says, if we, I, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. 
and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So you got to believe we are saved by grace. He became the debt offering for us in our place. And now we belong to him. That's how we, we take that leap of faith and become servants of the Most High God. Some people want to blame the devil for everything, but we got nobody to blame but ourselves right now. They want to say what they want to say because they like doing what they want to do. So they do. Where else? All they need is to die to self. See, once we die to the flesh in ourselves, we get to walk with the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And he gets all the glory because it's the Holy Spirit teaching us. It's the Holy Spirit guiding us. It's godly sorrow through the word of God. Jesus, the word became flesh. That brings the truth. You shall know the truth. God's word is truth. And it's the truth that sets us free. Even when Paul was troubled on every side, perplexed and persecuted, he did not let any of his circumstances overpower him. When we die to self, rather than let self react in difficult situations, we must let the resurrection power of Jesus Christ that abides in us take over our lives. This power cannot be in us unless we die to self. That's why I always tell people self is a big demon. Then self-pity, hate, anger, resentment, bitterness, loneliness, rejection, self-rejection, and other negative spirits will not have an opening to come into our lives. Then that beautiful Holy Spirit, that precious treasure that is in our earthen vessels will enable us, brothers and sisters, to keep our souls and body in perfect peace. That's why we belong to the Prince of Peace. There will be times that we will be thrown into the lion's den. I talked about that this morning. Remember the story of Daniel, Daniel chapter 6? He was righteous in the sight of God, yet God allowed him to be thrown into the, diet, the lion's den. So where do we go with this? Sometimes when you're criticized, judged wrongly, or malicious gossip, because we're not supposed to have lies, gossip, and slander flowing from our tongues. We're supposed to edify and build everybody up. When we go back to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were they not delivered from the fiery furnace? They, too, were considered righteous before God. Well, it's the same way for us today, brothers and sisters. How did they react when trouble came to them? They said, God is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. And what was really cool about it, we will not bow down to idols. God did not allow them. He didn't keep them out of that fiery furnace. He allowed them to be thrown in, and he delivered them from the fire the same way he's going to deliver us into his marvelous light forever and ever. That's what faith does. It makes you and I children of the king. Even their clothes didn't get burned in that furnace. When you permit your flesh to die, to its right you allow, God can work in you and through you in resurrection power. And there, there's that opportunity for healing, deliverance, and whatsoever thing you need in your life. This is all based on the principles that Jesus was asked to die for our sins. Jesus had the right to choose whether or not he would lay down his life. John 10, 18, Jesus, who is God, decided that he was going to do the will of the Father. He did not have to do anything to resurrect himself. All he had to do was decide to die, and God raised him by the power of the Holy Spirit, same way God's going to raise you and I. But of the spirit of him that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, he that raised Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies 
by his spirit that's dwelleth in you. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. The Holy Spirit will not compete with the old nature, with self-interest or self-righteousness. We must reckon ourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 6, 11. Wow. There is so much here to talk about, brothers and sisters. If you cannot do what these scriptures are saying, start with dying to self. Jesus said that the devil had nothing in him. That is nothing in common with him, John 14, 30. I wish that you would all say the same thing. There are many things that I could do that the devil likes. I could get angry. I could lose my temper. I could become envious. I could also speak the wrong words. I could also speak negative words. But the word tells us to edify and build each other up or have nothing to say at all. Even sometimes we pray the wrong kind of prayer with the wrong motive. We have to come overcome all these things by dying to self. And that's what I preach to everybody all the time, brothers and sisters. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, King James Version, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And Paul was also talking about mortifying the flesh and all fleshly desires, striving to be holy because our God is holy forever. We sing that song here in the daily house of prayer. And that something that you can do is called self-sacrifice, presenting your body a living sacrifice. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and is the perfect will of God. And Paul further admonishes us not to be worldly minded, not to love the rudiments of the world, neither the things that are in the world. We begin by the renewing of our minds, by the way we think, by changing our habit patterns, by saying no to the fleshly desires. To wrap it up in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, so I could get on with the next part of the teaching today. Paul further admonishes us not to be worldly minded, not to love the world, but to renew our minds. And here's God's word, okay? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You hear that? Once again, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If anyone love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. Once again, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. By presenting your body as a living sacrifice, you must die to self, and come alive in Christ, you know? Romans uh, 13, 14 says to make no provision for the fulfillment of the flesh. How much more do I got to preach this today? There is something you can do about it. There always is. The trouble with Christians today is they don't deal harshly with the flesh, what should you do? You must reckon your body to be dead and bury it. By doing nothing about it, you keep facing the same problem time and time again. And when you're dead, you're dead. Okay? From receiving a gift or getting close to God in John 5, 14, Jesus told the man who, who was healed to go and sin no more, lest a worse thing would come upon you. So that, that's pretty powerful. And, and, you know, I started out with come out from amongst them. Now I want to finish in something that I, I preach it, I live it. And, and God's word tells us 
you want to be in the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through pulling down the strongholds. Let me let me share and give you the teaching I so much want to close in for all of us right now today, brothers and sisters. And I mean that with all my heart. Fasting is spiritual dynamite. Do you need dynamite in your lives? We all do, brothers and sisters. And, and Jesus said, nothing, it'll move mountains. Upon Mount Zion, God's holy mountain, there'll be deliverance. Jesus said, when the disciples said, how we, how we couldn't cast that demon out of the little boy, and Jesus looked at his disciples, the same thing he's telling you and I today, brothers and sisters, this kind goeth only by prayer and fasting. The Lord has this dynamite for you and I. We need to blast out those stubborn areas of sin and rebellion. Jesus said, how? You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit come upon you. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. The word power here in the Greek is dunamis. And from dunamis, we get the words dynamite, dynamon, dynamite. So when you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive the dynamite power. That's what happened to me 38 years ago, brothers and sisters, when I became a believer. And when I read the Gospels and I, I read Psalms and Proverbs and I weeped, I weeped, brothers and sisters, because that's where if my people would humble themselves and pray, we got to get to that place where we're we're praying, we're fasting, we're crying out for God's grace and his mercy to be used by God, to set the captives free, to heal the sick. There's so much that the body of Christ is not doing today, and we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Fasting lights the fuse. It sets the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit in your life every day. Fasting is one of the most powerful weapons of spiritual warfare that the God has given to his people. Yet there's very little teaching offered in this area. Most believers are quite unaware of the power and benefits found in the discipline of fasting. Notice I say discipline of fasting because you have to learn to present your body a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service to be that man or woman being used by God in a miracle ministry because casting out devils is a miracle ministry. Deliverance, healing is the miracle ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. John 14, 12 says, greater things ye shall do because he goes to the Father and makes intercession for us. And if we're obeying the word of God and, and uh presenting our bodies and living the way God tells us to live in the word of God, you can ask him anything and he will do it. Wow. Oh, ye of little faith. You know, I believe the reason for us teaching this, my heart with you guys tonight, I had to redo this message because Somewhere along the line, someone dropped the ball, whether it was me, whether it was one of the co-hosts, because fasting is a powerful spiritual warfare weapon. Satan doesn't want us to have this in our arsenal in keeping believers from hearing the truth of God's word. However, the teaching of the New Testament assumes that fasting is already an important part for every believer's life. Brothers and sisters, I pray that this is an important part of your life, hearing my little message or my little sermonette today. I believe the reason for this is fasting is a powerful spiritual warfare weapon. Satan seems to have done his homework 
in keeping all believers from hearing this. However, it's already an important part of believers' lives once they know the truth and the truth sets them free. I've seen many testimonies of people double-minded, people schizophrenic, people just lives radically changing. Even in War on the Saints, page 271, prayer and fasting, all bodily function ceases until the victory is won. And so many people have not disciplined to present their body a living sacrifice. I see many churches and many people overweight. Even doctors know there's a problem there because heavy doctors die young. They had cassette tapes out years ago about it. And all I want to say is, do you see the point I'm trying to bring across today? If you fast, he said when. He didn't say if you fast. He said when you fast. He said when you fast, pour oil on your head. Wash your face so that no one will know you're fasting, but only the Father who is unseen, and your Father who is unseen will reward you. Matthew 6, verses 17 and 18. In the ninth chapter of Luke, we find a time when Jesus' disciples were unable to cast a particular, particularly a ferocious demon out of a little child. Well, I had that happen in 1986, a 13-year-old child, and nobody could help him. The Catholic Church, the Protestant Church, and, and the people. I left my ministry card at the Daughters of St. Paul, and the nuns called me and said, Brother Charlie, there's a little boy, and... He needs help. His mother thinks he has an unclean spirit. And they called me, brothers and sisters. The spirit would send the child into fits. I witnessed it. His family was hopeless. What a night weekend that was. I got everybody fasting and praying for the little boy. Long story, short story, I got the testimony. He got, he got delivered, his whole family, grandmother, uncles, they all got saved because of the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't a Catholic priest. It wasn't a Protestant pastor. It was just a brother named Charlie Costello who was a believer, and I usurped, usurped my authority in Christ, believing that the word of God said, this goeth out only by prayer and fasting. And three days into the fast, the child got set free. See, when it's real, it's real. When God brings you to the truth, the truth sets you free. The same thing happens today, brothers and sisters, when you and I can't or won't do the works of Jesus. People around you blame God. Later, they blame the people. After Jesus just cast the demon out, the disciples said, why couldn't we do it? Jesus said, some demons don't come out, but by prayer and fasting. Let's consider principles of fasting found in the Old Testament. I mean, it, it's so there. You know, if my people would humble themselves and pray, he would heal the land, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. But you still got to repent. Turn from your wicked ways. Brothers and sisters, if you're living a life contrary to the word of God, you're not going to have the power of God operating because you're committing sin. And sin separates your prayers, my prayers, from being answered. You know, what was true in the Old Testament, even King Jehoshaphat set himself to seek the Lord by proclaiming a fast throughout all the land. But we got a problem in the United States right now. 
And if if God doesn't intervene, you can kiss the United States goodbye, brothers and sisters. That was the reason I wanted to get this on the airways right away. And the devil, the devil tried to stop it by it not being recorded. But you know what? God knows my heart. And if King Jehoshaphat set himself to seek the Lord by proclaiming a fast throughout the land, he understood something that believers desperately need to know even in our days today. He knew that fasting was a way to get God's special attention during desperate times. In fact, fasting is the way to obtain God's special attention. So as the story proceeds, God did indeed come through in dramatic and supernatural way to rescue his people from their enemies. Well, real time, he can, if they're trying to turn America into a communist socialist country, we need Jesus Christ to move in the hearts of this nation right now. And the right person gets in that's going to do God's will so that we could get our prayers that we pray every day answered for a multitude, the harvest, the end time harvest can come to be. What was true then in the Old Testament can be true today if we would believe. You know, Jehoshaphat became weak because he understood that when you're weak, then when you're strong, he knew he was weak, but he wasn't weak enough. He and his people needed to get really weak and broken so that God's deliverance power would come and rescue them from the enemies. That's why it's so important if my people would humble themselves and pray and we cry out to God for the salvation of the United States of America right now. You know, many believers today would like to have sufficient power in their lives to set others free from Satan's power. But in order to fight and win any battle of the spirit, you must be willing to pay the price. Our Lord Jesus fasted often. He kept his walk fine-tuned through the discipline of fasting. The Apostle Paul also tells us in his epistles that he fasted often. Fasting is the ultimate way to crucify your flesh. Jesus said that all who follow him must take up their cross and deny themselves. Denial is denying the flesh. Sometimes the flesh wants this and wants that. Even in, in, in a marriage, husband and wife says, don't deny each other your bodily affection, except for a time of fasting. So fasting is very important. You can see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul tells us repeatedly in the books of Galatians, Romans, that we are to be crucified with Christ. That means we have to imitate the walk in the Spirit. Frankly, the most effective and practical way to be crucified is to fast, to periodically de de deny your flesh the basic substance of food. So it's not about eating just vegetables or drinking juices. It's about real fasting, brothers and sisters. And when I first learned about it all, I didn't like the concept because I loved to eat. I was in the restaurant business back in the 80s. And I inherited my Italian metabolism from my family. And we could eat anything, food, ice cream, cake. You name it, we didn't care if we gained or lost weight. And all my family members, they're not like me today. Most of them are overweight, 
They're out of control. They're not worshiping Jesus Christ. They have to continually watch their weight and be careful about what and how much they eat. But I've been blessed with the unique way that I've been able to put my faith in the word of God. And here I am at my age today being a, an open book, preaching the truth of God's word and putting it into practice so other people can see the answered prayer in my life, the salvation of souls, the people that have been delivered, people that have been healed, because the Holy Spirit dwells within the believer. And if you're walking not contrary to the word of God, you're going to see the glory of God. I've been pre preaching this for many years. Even the apostle Paul understood that self-denial was the only way to walk the Christian faith. He too had to learn to keep his passions, cravings, and desires of his body in check. Because if he didn't, he would have been disqualified from the things that he earnestly desired when he was crying out to God, you know? So the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. You wonder why God put it in the word. Have you ever said to yourself, tomorrow morning, I'm going to get up early and seek the Lord? So you set your alarm for five o'clock? Well, brothers and sisters, I've never had to set an alarm clock since I've been a Christian. You go to bed excited. You praise God. I'm going to do it. I'm going to get up early and spend time with God. And I do that all the time, brothers and sisters. And before you know it, it's 5 a.m. You open your eyes. You look at the clock. Bingo. And then it's real. The spirit is willing but you don't want to get out of bed. But see, the good thing is you can wake up in the middle of the night and take that time to bind and loose and go after the enemy, not only in yourself, but praying for other people. And it's a great secret place to be in. If you'll meet with God this morning and say, yay, okay, give me five more minutes of prayer, Father. I'll pray here under the covers. Have you ever done that? I do it all the time. I pray for my wife. I pray for my children, my grandchildren, my animals. Yes, Lord. And I pray for all the people in my prayer group. And I just want to thank you. I want to share this principle with others. I want an extension. I tell them to watch my grandchildren grow up. And more, if you're interested in fighting effectable spiritual warfare, but are not operating in the principles of fasting, you're going to be very disappointed. In fact, you'll barely get off first base spiritually if you're walking in these principles. Fasting is the most powerful weapon we have as believers. In fact, few things impose God more. Let's look at an amazing story in the Old Testament, you know, King Asa. And I'm going to close here. First Kings 16, 29, 33. King Asa of Judah had been on the throne 38 years when Ahab became the king of Israel. And Ahab reigned for 22 years, but he was even more wicked than his father, Omri. He was worse than any other king in Israel. And as though they were not enough, he married Jezebel. And there we have the Ahab and the Jezebel spirits, the controlling spirits, the, the man not being the spiritual head and the woman taking control over the king. The very essence of how the enemy operates today in the real world. Same demons. And, and as he married Jezebel, the daughter of King Ethbel of the Sidonites, that's because they were worshiping Baal people. First, he built a temple and an altar for Baal in Samaria. Then he made other idols and did more anger to the Lord God of Israel than any other kings before him in Israel. 
Needless to say, Ahab was a bad king. He seemed to go out of his way to find things to do that would provoke the Lord. And there's quite a few chapters in the Bible. All I want to say to everybody is what fasting will do for you and I, brothers and sisters. Here's my closing today in this. And it, it, it clears the spiritual air around us. Fasting is a powerful reconnector to God. By denying yourself through fasting, you're showing him how much you love him. Remember, God's a spirit. I've got so many demons screaming at me in deliverance how much they hate fasting because it destroys their kingdom. Wake up and hear what the spirit is saying through Brother Charlie here right now. The enemy hates it when you and I fast. Satan doesn't want you to know anything about the discipline of fasting. In the fourth chapter of Luke, we find the devil suffering humiliating defeat at the hand of Christ after he fasted for 40 days in the wilderness. So obviously the enemy certainly doesn't want God's people to understand and move in the vital spiritual weapons. Unfortunately, however, most believers today are far more into feasting than fasting. The only difference between fasting and feasting is the letter E. There's nothing wrong with feasting, mind you. Solomon said, whatsoever you do, do it with all your might. When it's time to feast, you feast. But remember, when it's time to fast, fast, exclamation mark. Speaking of feasting, it's a fact there's no better way to break a compulsive problem with gluttony or overeating than by fasting. The same thing's true with the compulsive drives of lust. A good one or two week fast will bring marvelous victory to those areas, particularly if followed up with an intense ministry of deliverance. So you look at this and what it's appointed to do when we're obedient to God's word. When, when, when I'm not with my disciples, Jesus said, my disciples will fast. So look in the mirror, brothers and sisters. If you're doing your part, God will do his part. My last word to everybody today. Have you ever woken up in a foggy morning being depressed, feeling terrible? While the air is clear again and you see where you're going, well, you know, a lot of folks are that way spiritually. Their heads are fog bound. They walk around with confusion and anxiety in their mind. My wife said something to me before I came up to re-record. She said, why don't these people sing and read Psalm 23 instead of taking psychotropics? Well, why don't you fast? Fasting is like the rising of the sun. It burns off the mental fog so that you can see clearly. I know plenty of people that fasted and got free from schizophrenia in my spiritual walk. Not my testimonies, their testimonies. And I've helped so many people by fasting two or three weeks, water only. That's just a testimony, brothers and sisters. Fasting has a way of clearing the spiritual air around you so that you can really hear the Lord's voice when he speaks to you. So this isn't just for the worker, it's even for the person that's possessed, okay? In fact, before any major decision in your life, something that I've always done, even a major purchase, the house that I'm living in, I did a 10-day water fast, and God not only sent the person to buy our other property, but opened the door when I couldn't buy this property, the one I'm living, and I am so blessed because I obeyed the word of God. 
nothing will be impossible. This goeth only by prayer and fasting. Fasting enhances your spiritual senses. We all have the natural senses of feeling, sight, hearing, smell, taste. But did you know that they have, they have their counterparts in the spirit? Taste and see what the Lord, that the Lord is good. How many times do you say that to people? And yet you've never really put fasting into discipline. We're told in Revelation, Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Paul speaks, the eyes of the understanding that will be enlightened. We have spiritual counterparts to our natural senses. When you fast, your spiritual senses become sharper, and you're more able to perceive and grasp the things of the Lord. Fasting is the only way to go when you need clear guidance and direction in your life. And it releases God's anointing. So, Heavenly Father, I thank you for the message. I thank you that I had to redo it with a little more amplification at the end on fasting. And let it bless those that hear this message, Father, that those lukewarm Christians would get on fire with the power of the Holy Ghost today, Father. I pray this for all people in Jesus' name. Thank you for listening, and God bless you all. Amen.